Education, data, equity. Reluctant project manager. Gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. So the word hope is derived from the late Old English hopa, meaning to have confidence in the future. Dr. Chan Hellman is the university, uh, at the university, works at the University of Oklahoma. He's the director of the Hope Research Center. And he says, hope is not a wish or a feeling, but a goal-setting framework designed to help us, uh, desi- based on our ability to find pathways and generate the willpower to make the future possible. A name you might be familiar with in the audacity of hope. Former President Barack Obama says, hope is not blind optimism. Hope is the belief that destiny will not be written for us, but by us who have the courage to remake the world as it should be. Whether you're a psychologist, an etymologist, or a politician, most of us understand that what differentiates hope from a wish or an idea, a desire, or a preference is that it has something to do with the actions associated with it. For the next 20 minutes, I'm going to spend 25 minutes or so, you will hear me make reference to this concept of moving from hope to action or hope being associated with action. And I'm going to do that not because I respect the people I just quoted, although that's true, um, but because there's an evidence-based link here. The connection between hope and action is rooted deep in what we know about the science of and the psychology of hope. But before we get too far, hi. I'm Diana. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am uh, Chicagoan through and through. Can I just get a sense of like who I'm talking to? Raise your hand if you are from Chicago. Excellent. Okay. Raise your hand if you are a software engineer or coder or developer currently. Wow. Okay. A lot of you. Raise your hand if you would like to be but aren't yet. Okay, a couple of you. Any like product design, non-tech folks? Excellent. Awesome. Okay, so there's a, a polite smattering of a handful of you from uh, different areas. I, I am also from a different area. So I describe myself as a social scientist by training and a software engineer by trade. What I, what I mean by that is that I spent the first part of my career trying to better understand how people's online behavior represents their offline experiences. Now, my experience has most, most of that time was spent in the world, the world of psychology and psychiatry, um, if you're like really nervous. We can talk about it another time. Um, But that's why I circle back to this idea of there being an evidence base for hope. This is the world that I occupy now. Um, at the, uh, this is the sweet spot that led me to the Obama Foundation, and it lives, it, it, the work that I do now lives somewhere in between technology, psychology, and policy. Um, and it's not, uh, it's probably something you would associate with the Obama Foundation. Just a few years ago now, uh, construction on the Obama Presidential Center began. You'll hear me say OPC. That's what I mean, Obama Presidential Center. It's a lot easier to say. Um, that began in 2021. And around the same time, uh, the uh, product and technology team at the Obama Foundation uh, was also founded. A team of product designers, product managers, engineers, data scientists, user researchers, etc. cetera. And uh, I've been involved in hiring since the inception of that team. And one of the things I hear all the time is, why in God's name would the Obama Foundation need software engineers? You guys just like really like WordPress, right? Right. And, and <laughs> that's a whole other, that's a different talk. But um, the, the answer to this question becomes fairly straightforward. If you're already a nerd, if you're a, a museum tech nerd in particular, you might know where I'm going with this. But the answer to that question becomes fairly straightforward once you know what to look for. And the answer to that question goes something like this is an example. This is an example, I'm going to move over here, of an interactive, our team recently went to the Nashville, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, the uh, Museum of African American Music. And what you'll see here is everything you probably are familiar with when it comes to web technology. 
So what you see here is there are things that you can tap. This is a screen, and if I tap Langston Hughes, you'll see that the, the content changes, and every piece of this is software and, and hardware in some combination. Um, and uh, whether you're talking about the interactive tables, kiosks, audiovisual playback systems, you're looking at the integration of hardware and software in a way that we don't always think about when we think about building software. Now, I am about to speak out of necessity in broad generalities about what it is that we're building at the Obama Presidential Center and what tech we're building. Why? The building is still under construction and our technology is still under construction. There's a good chance that some portion of what I say tonight is going to be out of date or no longer accurate by the time the building opens in 2025. Consider this your caveat, caveat issued, and with that, we will talk a little bit more about some of the details. Um, I want you to picture any museum that you've been to that's built with, been built within the last 20 years or so. And like those, the Obama Presidential Center will have a, a few key characteristics that make it necess that necessitate the building of software. The first is that the Obama Presidential Center, like many museums, will be a multi-sensory experience. Uh, audio, photography, video, lighting, placemaking, tactile experiences. We don't intend to overwhelm you. But we do intend to bring you along a journey of experiential storytelling. The technologies at the OVC will be action-oriented, and I mean that in both literal and figurative sense. We'll talk about all of this in more detail. But by action-oriented, I mean both the action of doing things, like interacting with things, but the con conceptually speaking, we're also hoping to build out exhibits that drive you towards hope, from hope towards an action, a very specific action, a tailored action. Uh, and lastly, but unequivocally most importantly, uh, the OPC is built for everyone. Everywhere, everybody, of every type, online, on site, everywhere. And that comes with it both a set of cultural implications as well as a set of technical ones. So into the details, um, this is a, a real rendering, these are available online, but this is a rendering of one of the rooms inside the Presidential Center. And what you might notice is that there's like really high vaulted ceilings, right? And part of the physical architecture as well as the software of the building is intentionally designed to inspire a sense of hope, of optimism, of openness. And that's part of what you'll see in what's, what's here referred to as the Sky Room. Um, the OPC will combine traditional storytelling, written prose, as well as digital installations and interactives that allow folks to engage in this journey of storytelling in bringing, moving people from hope to action. So what does that mean? Technically speaking, let's talk about some of the details. Some of these are going to be fairly obvious to you once you know what to look for. Anytime you walk into a museum, you'll see something like this. They might be connected. These monitors might be connected. They might be separate. They might be touch screens. They might not. Some of them might show linear media videos that just move in order. Other things might respond to different types of interactions that you have. Every bit of that requires integration with some kind of piece of software and that touch screen monitor in the same way that we interact with with our phones as a touch screen, that same kind of technology is going to be in place throughout the museum in a variety of different locations. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you this time, close your eyes if you can, um, if you're willing to, and I want you to picture the last time you walked into a museum. And I want you, so you, you saw things, but I want you to think about what you heard. Now, if you think carefully about it, as you walk through different exhibits, you might notice that you're watching a screen in front of you, and the speaker to your left is describing what's happening, is responding, is playing back that same thing that's happening on the screen. And as you walk through the exhibit, you might hear it above you or to the sides, but as you move to a different exhibit, that audio from that screen that might still be here starts to fade into the background. And you start to hear a little bit more actively some of the things that are happening over here. Right? Now, all of that sounds kind of trivial, if not a bit like movie directing, and it is, but all of that, too, is software. This ability to synchronize, to identify which speakers and locations, and based on where a person is in a particular space, the ability to associate locations with speakers and play back in that synchronized but very delicate fashion is software. And, and there are also pieces here about acoustics and the building, of the, the construction of a building. That's like, again, a whole other talk that I'm frankly not qualified to give. But I can talk about the software. 
Um, so, so that talk, that's a little bit about what we mean by multi-sensory, but the, the experiences at the OPC are also intended to be action-oriented. And I've mentioned a little bit about this idea of moving people towards action, but what I haven't mentioned is that either before their exhibit to the OPC or at the very start of the OP their visit to the OPC, we expect visitors to endorse, whether by survey or some other mechanism, a set of civic areas of interest for them. And so that might be reproductive health care, it might be environmental justice, there could be a ver uh, any of the political or, or civic topics that any of you all are interested in. The idea is that a, a polite smattering of those will be available as a, a chain of storytelling that you can follow through the museum as an individual person. And if you're thinking like an engineer, you might have noticed that that requires individual location precision and individual preferences following you throughout that experience. You with me? Okay, cool. And so that's part of what we mean by action-oriented. And I will also say that the center is not, you often hear it referred to as the Obama Library. It's not a library. It's not, the, it, it is a center, but it is a center with a museum and a campus. And uh, it will also be home to branches of the Chicago Public Library and the Chicago Park District. And so while we're talking about concrete and moving people from hope to action in a civic way, we also mean that there's a lot of things to do at the center, not just things to interact with, like kiosks and interactive storytelling. This is another example from the National Museum of African American Music, which I highly, highly recommend you visit. It is an extraordinary place to visit. But similarly to these, these are touch screens interactives, um, and we will use those as part of storytelling. But the other thing, in combination with the Chicago Public Library, the Park District, uh, the campus itself, as well as the museum building, there's a whole lot to navigate. And if you've ever walked around a giant campus, you might be familiar with how helpful it is to be able to whip out your phone and figure out exactly where you are and where and and how to get to different places and in what time period. Can we use Google Maps for this? Yes, but we also would like to be a little bit more sophisticated than that, right? And so we'll talk a little bit more about some of the the like intricate technical details that go into wayfinding and navigation. But what you might notice is that every single one of these things is a service that somebody has to build. And it's part of our job to figure out how to build those in a way that is privacy preserving and safe and ethical, but effective. The OPC is a space that is built for everyone and everybody. And that has implications, like I said, for uh, how we build both the software itself as well as the physical space. Now I'm gonna take a step back for a minute. Anybody familiar with the concept of a numeronym? Numeronym, anybody? Yeah, do you know what a numeronym is? It's when you uh, take out the middle letters of a very low word and replace it with the number to then take it out and get an acronym. Exactly. Basically, it's an acronym based on the number of things, uh, the number of letters in a particular word. If you're in the web community, and if you'd use just hashtag ally, you will see a lot of, there's a lot of wonderful conversation happening around this hashtag ally, but it's not actually ally. It's A11Y, which is, uh, it's, there's 11 letters between, in, between the A and the Y in accessibility. Similarly, you'll see internationalization, sometimes abbreviated as I18N. Same idea. It's a numeronym. So when you see ally, but really, if I was being uh, uh, very open, aware of other folks' disabilities, I will say 11, uh, A11Y, because some folks who use the screen readers to navigate the web doesn't say ally, it says A11Y, and that's why we try to, be, uh, try to be aware of those differences. But the point is that there's a whole community and a set of uh, rules, no, I'll call them guidelines, for how to build technologies in a way that is accessible. And when we say accessible, we mean that in the most basic sense, accessible to machines as well as individuals. Why machines? Well, it's good business for your, your tools and your things to be readable by machines for things like search engine optimization, but more specifically and more importantly, for adaptive devices. That if you're using, if, you're, if, we, if the, the bones of your application are fundamentally good, it becomes a lot easier for things like screen readers or braille transcribers or other forms of assistive technologies to be able to hook in to the details of your hardware and software and it allows us to move a lot more effectively through some of the requirements of very specific accessibility related technologies. And so accessibility is at the core of everything that we're doing both in the physical space as well as the software. Now, we started to talk about wayfinding, and there are a lot of other intricate details that have to do specifically with accessibility and our goal of creating a very, very inclusive space within not just the physical space, but the exhibits themselves.
I want to draw your attention to, this is a picture from the National uh, Canadian Museum of Civil Rights. They worked with a partner that we are also working with to do something similar. This is not our physical space, but it will be something similar. I want you to notice that this is what we call a universal access point. Now, in most buildings, you're accustomed to seeing this, a room number with some braille, but what I want to draw your attention to is this little Bluetooth beacon. And what this Bluetooth beacon does is it makes it possible for me to hold up my device the same way you might do it with like a, uh, like a QR code scanner, except slightly more hardware-based. And this allows me to identify where I am within that space. It also ties back to native accessibility features that I can tap into from using my mobile device. I can wave my phone in front of this thing and get information about where I am as well as the exhibit content associated with where I am. These universal access points are going to be all over the building and all over the exhibits as ways of, to, uh, of giving a variety of folks and a variety of devices different ways to hook into that core architecture because when you can do that you make them more accessible in the most literal sense to the widest group possible. Another example of accessibility, and this gets into hardware a little bit, um, another example, again, from the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, but something very similar to what we're going to do, every single exhibit interactive and every single exhibit piece of it, linear media, so linear media we mean just like television, like media production, standard media production, all of those things need the ability to be able to be, uh, need to be visible via, like, uh, uh, need to have captions, need to have uh, ASL interpretation, that was the word I was looking for, and uh, we need to be able to offer people those things in their own specific context. So, for example, if you have your voiceover set up on your iPhone, voiceover is actually not super common among folks with hearing, uh, hearing impairments, but if, or vision impairments, rather, because voiceover has its own weird contracts, but if you were to bring, to use, to be a standard voiceover user, and you brought your phone to the Obama presidential Center, it is our goal that you can still leverage those native tools that you already have set up on your device, but hook in to the technologies and the keypads and the universal access points that we have throughout the museum. And so part of the goal here is that we're not just building the interfaces themselves to be accessible, we're not just building the physical spaces to be accessible, but the actual experience of moving from space to space, interactive to interactive, and even location to location, is intended to be a fully inclusive and personalizable experience which is a little different than some of the things you might have uh, experienced if you've walked through museums in the la that were built in the last like 20 or so years. Often you will find, I just was recently on a six month tour of the United States going to a variety of different museums. And one of the things I found often is that accessibility is an afterthought. This is the kind of thing that happens when accessibility is not an afterthought, but is, is baked in to the core fundamental architecture of what we're building. Uh, lastly, a little bit less of the point, but still very much relevant, the physical spaces of the OPC are, have also been deeply evaluated for accessibility. So we're not just talking about software, we also mean things like mobility devices. So a big piece of the Obama Presidential Center campus involves terraforming what is effectively the top of the building to expand the greenery and green space area available for walking in Jackson Park. And part of rebuilding that means making sure that every single path, every single corner is wide enough for any variety of mobility aids to be able to spin entirely to pass it around. And some of these we would consider table stakes, but are things that we have to actually think really carefully about. And those kinds of things can get missed if we are not considering accessibility at the core of everything that we build, software, hardware, and physical spaces combined. All right, so building for everybody can mean a few things. So far I've talked about what building the experiences for everybody means, but there's also a technical piece here, and that involves building for everybody and assuming that everybody will be doing everything all of the time nonstop and building a piece of software that can be resilient enough to assume that everybody will do everything all of the time nonstop. Right? And so that has infrastructural implications. Now this is where I'm going to get a little bit technical. And I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I'm going to do my best to make this not technical at all. But you're going to see some graphs that if you're not, or some images that if you're not familiar with software, they might make you panic. Please stay with me, I promise. 
This will not be that hard. So um, there are two core ways to build a major application. One is to do it all at once and then add new features to that big thing all at once, right? That's, those are your Facebooks, right? Facebook is a giant monolithic application. It's one app that does a million and one things, probably not so well, but it does a million and one things, right? There's an alternative, there's a few different alternatives for how to build software, but one alternative pattern is the microservice pattern. And what this means is that you focus on doing one thing Thing really, really well, and you make several of those services, and their job is to do one or two things very well, very effectively, and it allows you to continue to iterate on one of those few things over and over and over again. And so this is fundamentally the reason we would go with microservices instead of monoliths, is that it allows us to do this kind of cycle, this idea of we have multiple instances, multiple versions of a particular service, and we can iterate on it, make it better, make it faster, without ever really disrupting those other things that are also a part of our services, our service suite. With me? Did I lose anybody in the dust? No. Excellent. Okay. Uh, and so there are a few use cases for this. You might have seen this kind of diagram before. It has a lot to do with agile patterns. So for anybody who's like really into the weeds on some of the vocab associated with product management, agile refers to this, uh, this uh, pattern of software delivery that involves continuous iteration and deployment. So you, you, you deliver what we would refer to as the minimum viable product, you iterate on it, and then you keep going, and you do it over and over again. Um, likewise, the other thing that's really useful about this is that it's not just useful for iterating, so if this is version one, version two, version three, that's helpful, but it also means, because of the way we're setting up our infrastructure, we're using something called serverless microservices. Serverless and auto-scaling. And what that means is that if a bunch, if everybody in the planet decided on opening day to buy a ticket to the Obama Presidential Center, the the service that uh, handles that ticket management would duplicate itself over and over and over until there is enough server capacity to handle that load. It's a little bit like magic, not really, right? But what it does is it allows us to scale up really, really quickly and, and, and respond to the needs that we have. Speaking of building iteratively, uh, a lot of the things that we're working on at this particular moment are not, by software engineering terms, all that exciting. They are things like hardware connections and not a whole lot of UI and end up being really focused on kind of business needs. But ultimately, what we're working towards is the ability to create civic action recommendations. Right? So what does that mean? It means that we want, we, there are a lot of, we are all familiar, with a lot of really bad ways to create recommendation engines, right? They have to, do, there are examples, there are your YouTubes and your Facebooks, and most of what those uh, recommendation algorithms do is they say, give me more of the same, and they pull you down into one specific what I'm gonna to refer to as a rabbit hole. And part of the way that works is you, it gives you more of what you are already searching for. Part of what we're interested in is not giving you more of what you were already searching for, but giving you more of what you didn't know you wanted to search for. And that is a really challenging problem. And it's why it becomes really helpful to be able to separate these different services into separate applications, each of which we can iterate on. Some of these are not going to work. <laughs> Some of the ideas that we have, the first ideas that we have for all three of these services are not going to work, right? But the most expensive and resource intensive way to test an idea is to build it out as a product. And so instead, we start with small, scalable microservices that we can replace if needed without disrupting the rest of our entire ecosystem. So, like I said, we're, it, uh, it is our intention to bring folks on a storytelling journey from hope to action, and that that journey will begin before they enter the OPC, it will last the duration of their visit to the OPC, and hopefully it will follow them afterwards with concrete recommendations for future actions. Uh, but ultimately, this is a, like I said, this is a very hard thing to do. Even if you just think about what is hopeful content, what is a hopeful story, there's not a good answer, and reasonable people will disagree about the answer to that question. And I, but I am, I am going to end on this, or rather, what it reminds me of. Uh, I'm going to circle back to uh, my roots in psychology for a minute, and all the, we're going to circle all the way back to an old study. Um, there's an experiment in, it's an experimental paradigm in psychology and psychiatry that's been adopted as a way of trying to assess how people respond to stress. 
Uh, it's specifically, it's called the forced swim test. And it is as gruesome as it sounds. Um, for what it's worth, this was invented before research ethics boards were invented. And, and the premise of the experiment is something like this. Uh, the, there was one particular researcher who wanted to know how long it would take for a, a rat to drown. So how long would they try to, it's gruesome, I warned you. Um, they, they wanted to see how long it would take for a rat to give up. Right? And so there's, that's why they call it a forced swim test. And I'm going to spare you some of the really gruesome details here, but the short version is that a professor at Johns Hopkins was using this to try to understand how long it would take to swim to failure. But once that baseline was established, it turned out to be about 15 minutes. Um, when that baseline was established, he tried the strategy on a different cohort of rats. But right before that 15 minute mark, the one where they, that we had determined was the end, the time where a, a rat would give up, um, they expected exhaustion at the 15 minute mark and instead of letting them exhaust themselves, the researchers plucked them off, dried them off, let them rest for a few minutes, and then put them back in the water to see how they would behave. And what happened was that the, water, the, the, the rats that were rescued at the 15 minute mark and then were put back into the water ended up being able to last for like 60 more minutes, which violated the entire premise of the, argue, or the, entire premise of the study. The premise of the study was that the, re the reason uh, that the failure point for a mouse to survive in water was 15 minutes. Now, there are a variety of people and a variety of ways to interpret the conclusions here, but one popular conclusion that people have come to and one plausible research or, or plausible finding, uh, one plausible reading rather, came from the researcher himself, who said that the rats quickly learned that the situation is not actually hopeless, that when you eliminate the hopelessness and demonstrate that there is something different can happen, the rats did not die. They kept going. Um, because hope is unique in that it relies on a belief that your actions can change something about the future. The OPC is intended to be a living, experiential reminder of what actions can do and what our collective efforts can accomplish when we channel, channel them towards specific civic action. And sometimes we just need a reminder to keep swimming. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, what's like your favorite museum tech of the ones you've visited? Oh, okay. So uh, <laughs> this is an easy answer, but I will preface it. Everybody at work, nobody likes my answer to this because we're not going to do it and most places shouldn't do it. But holograms? So the best, uh, no, I, okay, so it sounds extra, but hear me out. So there, I went to um, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Montgomery, Alabama, I believe, and they had... What I can only describe, uh, so it was a hologram, but not like the hologram from like Star Trek version, right? So what happened, it was an extraordinary experience and they did not allow video or photography, otherwise I would have done it. There was a hallway and the hallway was lined with, cell can you all hear me? The hallway was lined with what were uh, uh, purported to be slave, slave chambers. And as you walked up to each individual chamber, the, uh, the smoke would rise from the ground. And within that smoke, there was a projection of light of uh, an actress, presumably, uh, reading out the story in a very well acted way, uh, reading out the real words of some of uh, uh, the folks who were, who were being, the stories that were being told from the slaves from that particular period, time period. I have, uh, since I've worked at the foundation, I've been the person who's been like, hear me out, what if we do a hologram of Obama? Like, come on, right? Uh, and, and people, as they should, are like, okay, but why? This was the first experience, which it's a fair question, but this was the first experience that I went, I know we're not doing holograms, but this was really freaking cool. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that's my answer. I really do fundamentally believe that some version of holograms can be really powerful. Um, but when you say holograms, people are like, ooh, like Jetsons. Like, you know, lights going across the thing, and that's not what we mean. But I, that's by far the most moving thing. Thank you for the question. Hey, um, uh, my f I have two questions. Uh, the first one was, how does the universal access point actually leverage, how does it access the native accessibility things? Maybe without getting too technical, but a little technical? I'm going to figure out an, uh, a straightforward and easy way to answer that question without getting too technical. How does the universal access point, I'm sorry, can you repeat, how does the universal access point what? Like how does it turn on voiceover? Ah, 
so so uh, it doesn't. What it does is it allows your individual device to be aware of a very specific ID associated with that panel. And somewhere else, there is a database that says, here's the information associated with that panel. Here's what's near that panel. And we can prompt you on your individual device to say, hey, you just waved your phone in front of this thingy. Here's the stuff that's in that panel. How would you like to interact with it? Um, that is a very, oversimpli why, very oversimplified explanation. But does that help? It does, yeah. That's okay, actually pretty yes. cool. Cool. Um, the second question I had was, um, Around maybe the civic like topics, and, and I know that you ended on how you can make um, these topics more hopeful, but I, I guess maybe I've been jaded by the last few years, but how do you talk about reproductive rights in a hopeful way? <laughs> there, so there are a whole set of questions within that, and uh, let, me, let me back up. I think it's absolutely fair and arguably necessary to have approached the last few, to have come out of the last few years with a great deal of, at best, suspicion. Hmm. Um, what we know from the science of hope is that you can be deeply suspicious while also acknowledging the, the circumstances that has led to success in the past. So, for example, um, if we think about climate is a really obvious one that's like, yeah. So climate, for example, um, it real, real easy to get real depressed about all of it real fast. And it's also very easy to look at someone like Greta Thunberg or to look at some of the young folks who are taking steps now in their own communities um, and looking at them and saying, we did not get this, but they might. And there is something about the ability to associate, hope is the belief that that action can do something. And I think even in the absence of evidence sometimes, we do have stories and stories matter. And stories are important and stories can tell us what our actions might be able to do. That's I think what my answer to that question would be. All right, thank you. Um, maybe there's, Maybe not much you'll be able to share, but how have you uh, started? I know the building's still under construction. Yeah. How have you started to prototype a lot of the exhibits or design them, or how are you guys moving them forward? Yeah, um, so uh, there are, unfortunately, there are limits to what I am like allowed to say in, in public forums. Um, uh, we start by designing and developing, and, and not the software part. So there is... Uh, it, it, Implicit in everything I've just told you is uh, some real assumptions and research things that we need to verify with data around what actually gets people. We can tell a nice story about hope being motivating uh, or these specific stories of these specific change makers being motivating. But quite frankly, a big chunk of this is going to be about iteration. And so um, I made a comment about the most expensive way to test an idea is to build it. And so what we do instead is we start with very, um, we start with wireframes and then we go on to designs and those get vetted. Um, it is a very real challenge to navigate iterative software development with the, what I'm describing, which is, and there's a very real tension there. Some of that is about, the, it's, uh, it's our job as engineers to know that that's happening and make some educated guesses and anticipations about what they might need and build in response to that. But a lot of it ends up being what we call like a waterfall kind of pattern, inevitably. It's not great, it's not preferred, but it's how things end up working, which is sometimes those ideas really need to be refined and revisited uh, for each one of those exhibits. And that's what people are in the process process of doing now. The act of actually building them um, will come a lot later. We know some of, some of what I described are like the core things we know we need to be able to support, and there's plenty of work to do within that without building the physical exhibits themselves. But we do look at the work that's happening on, in the, the exhibits, the storytelling there, and see what, if anything, we as engineers can derive from that as a service that will need to exist for that exhibit to exist. Thanks. Thanks for this. It's uh, it's really refreshing to hear what's going on, uh, and I really love the microservices 
Thank that's, you. Uh, I that's, do. that's great. So what if we took that concept of microservices in this big building that's the Obama Presidential Center, and we said that instead of this big center, mm -hmm. what if that was just like one node on the network, and we had those microservices distributed out in the neighborhood and let the people in the neighborhood provide the hope that you're talking about? It's interesting that you say that because that is not fully dissimilar from what we intend to do. Um, so to be clear, the Obama Presidential Center is a campus, and it is a campus full, uh, it has a museum, but also things like community programming at the Chicago Public Library and others. It is, uh, first of all, you're on the money. That's exactly what we should do. Um, there is a starting place that happens where we, we have to begin with building the requirements for the center because that is the place that we are building. Uh, because that's we, we, we have to do that. That's like it has to be our first priority. Otherwise, there is no there is nothing else. But the center itself is intended to be a community hub for things like civic organization, not fostered by the Obama Foundation, but the uh, the foundation providing a space within the center for that kind of thing. And it is very much in line with how we are thinking about the software that we're building. That some of that may eventually, for example, become open source tools that are then used throughout the community. And, and of course there are a variety of like rabbit holes there and things that we need to be really careful about and doing that in a safe and ethical way. But you're right on the money. You're correct. And yes, we should do that. And hopefully we will. We have to build the center first and make sure all of those things run. But, you know, speaking for me personally, as, as an engineer on the team, um, it has been long part of my commitment since before I was hired that I believe fundamentally that the, the Obama Presidential Center and the engineers at the Obama Presidential Center in particular have a responsibility to uh, do a little bit of uh, a little bit a lot of community education on what uh, on dig information safety digital hygiene for kids and parents um, and that fundamentally I don't think I'm going out of bounds by saying that I think most of the foundation un understands that these are core to all of the concerns the president all the things the president cares about with misinformation and democracy all of that ultimately software engineers I believe are fundamentally and ex exceptionally well positioned to be able to talk about those kinds of things in a meaningful way that drives people towards actual understanding. On a personal note, one of my larger missions is that I fundamentally believe there is a language gap between the everyday person and the technologist. And we, as somebody who spans the, the, the disciplines of both psychology, policy, and technology, I consider it largely within my uh, jurisdiction, if you will, to figure out how to fill that language gap. Um, most technologists don't know how to do it. Most policy-oriented people don't know how to do it. And the truth is that my generation and millennials in here, we are the first generation of digital natives who have the ability to participate in these kinds of things, and that matters a lot. Um, and a big chunk of where we're at now, I'm rambling, a big chunk of where we're at now is results from a lack of language to be able to do the kinds of things you're describing, and you're on the money. And I'll, I'll leave it there, but... Yeah, uh, I'm curious about the stories. Yeah, and uh, you know anything you might be able to tell us about them, and then particularly how how the stories that uh, the center wants to tell uh, may have affected the development of the technology. So the stories are. Um, largely, if not entirely, focused on the individual actions of change makers and the context that surrounded them at the time, uh, at the time that they, specifically at the time that they made those. Now, there are lots of things still, uh, I will say I am not fully read in on every piece of every exhibit. Most of the things that I work with have to do with setting up the interactives, and so I don't, I'm not, there are people better, more familiar with all of the content across the board, and so I don't feel necessarily well positioned to talk about that, except to say that we know that they are, they are focused on change makers and understanding the stories and context that, that those change makers took those actions. As far as that has to do, uh, 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 insofar as it impacts how we choose to build. Um, if we do our jobs right, what we build will not be directly impacted by the content of the stories themselves, but by the way we choose to disseminate and understand who, uh, who consumes those stories, right? So part of our job is to figure out how to abstract out the piece that's about 
content understanding and dissemination and trust the folks who are in creative positions and writing positions to craft exactly what that story looks like. Our focus, though, is on understanding how we want those to be disseminated and in what way, and making sure that we have set up the infrastructure and the analytics to support that, such that if they change their mind, our software still runs, right? And so the idea being that, that really, um, stories come, uh, stories can only ever be interpreted from the current context in which we are consuming them. And the way we understand stories, particularly stories of policy or politics, uh, the way we understand those changes over time um, with additional context. And so with that in mind, part of the idea of some, a lot of these exhibits being digital in nature is it allows us to change the framing when that becomes necessary. Um, and so hopefully because of that, we want to maintain that ability to update the content as our understanding of our own present and, and, and past history has changed. We want to be able to maintain that flexibility. And so that's, it, that's why largely we would try not to be influenced too directly by the stories themselves, but by the structure and how we want to disseminate them. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. I guess I have a question about, kind of related to Steve's question. You mentioned kind of building for everybody. I think in there's been a decent amount of controversy around the building of OPC and some of the community members in the area having concerns about how that process has happened. So I'm curious, like, how do those folks, like, fit into that vision of everyone? And how does that kind of play out as you do try to build those community relationships going forward and, and you know, build those connections you were talking about? Yeah. Well, so the technology is one small piece of what the Obama Foundation broadly does, right? And so there are um, arms of our organization that are really explicitly and directly focused only on community impact. To the extent that our technologies have anything to do with it, um, that part of our mandate is to make those impacts easier to scale, right? And easier to scale within local communities as well as beyond them. Now, what you are alluding to has a lot to do, well, let me say it this way. I am a Chicagoan. I'm uh, a Chicagoan native through and through, through and two forever. Uh, I would be deeply, I grew up in, in Bucktown before Bucktown was whatever it is now. Y'all know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I grew up in pre-gentrified Bucktown before it was like strip malls and whatever. Um, uh, Bucktown of the 90s. And, and so uh, there's very few people. I am just as prone as anybody, as any Chicagoan, to not take anybody at their word when they say, we will not change this community. And what I will say is, you should not take anybody at their word, including me, or the foundation, or anybody else. What you should do, or what I would ask you, invite you to do, is to watch in the same way, we talked about transparency a little bit earlier today, right? Um, and I would say that to, to watch what we do, I think there is no, there is nothing that we could talk a big talk as much as we want. We could say all the cool things that we're going to do for the community, but none of that really matters. And any real Chicagoan will know better than to listen to us, right? But that ultimately, most of those those uh, the concerns are real. Those issues are real. We're aware of them, um, and. It is our job as an organization to put our money where our mouth is. And uh, no amount of talk will demonstrate that. Only our actions will. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, I wondered if, if it's, a, it's a personal question, so you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But I wondered if you'd share a little bit. You mentioned that your background's in social science, and you ended up working in software engineering. And uh, a lot of people come to Shy Hack Night looking for a career transition. I myself, my background is in political science, so my hats are off to you. I wonder if you'd share a little bit about like how did that happen? <laughs> so I can, um, but I, I will have to preface this by saying I am I have been made aware that this is the most unrelatable story. <laughs> um, so I, I will share it with you. So so uh, the truth is. Um, that I have never been to a boot camp. I was an extraordinarily nerdy kid in the 90s who had an escapist habit of building things on Dreamweaver. Mm. Um, and so, so the, the reality is uh, most of the people I work with have done boot camps or things like that. I had a very, very different experience. Um, the first time I was, one of the first 
early research positions I had was at Northwestern. And I had this moment, and I do, and it was, I say moment, but it was really like a set of weeks where I had a really, like, what was for me at the time, truly revolutionary idea, which is that people in healthcare and nonprofits, if you say, we want a web, you should make a website that does that, most people don't know how to do that. <laughs> and so we can giggle about it. Okay, no, well, so there's something funny there, but I, I need, to he- need you to hear the sincerity with which I, I had to realize that not, some of these were skills. And like I said, this is the most unrelatable story. I'm sorry. Um, I, I w- the truth is that I, I am self-taught. Um, I'm, I'm self-taught. I, uh, most of the work that I did in research was focused on the quantitative side of things. I was building. So when you do research, if you've ever done like a research study, they'll bring you, they can do a lot of things, but they'll bring you in, they'll put like a little hat on you and the hat will measure some signals. And then they'll say like, look at this screen and move your mouse when this thing happens. And it's somebody's job to build that and then figure out how much time it took to go from point A to point B. And they got to output that and spit it out in some kind of data that could be analyzable, et cetera. That was my job. And that is web development. Uh, it's web development, it's internal tools, it's way less boring, or way less interesting, rather. It's way more boring, right? It's a lot of like data analysis stuff. But it's the same kind of thing. Um, when I was at Northwestern, we started working on a, a project that uh, turned out, a research project that was going to be public-facing. And I went, wait a second. <laughs> this is way more fun if you do it for people yeah. instead of, yeah. And, and I, I truly, I, there were a couple moments where I was like, oh, People don't know how to do this, and I can actually like make a hobby. So I fully intended to go into academia, um, and I stayed in academia for a long time, and stayed in the in the publishing, and I still publish papers and do that kind of thing now. Um, but I, I, yeah, I was fully an academic person, and I accidentally became an expert because I'm a nerd, and um, that kind of nerddom happened to be really lucrative in 2020 and onward, or 2010 at the time and onward. So. Um, but I'm happy to talk about nerding out and exploring. I think that the, the folks who are self-taught, I can, I can say that uh, curiosity gets you further than anything else. Absolutely. Um, if you can find something to be excited about, it doesn't have to be the code. It can be what you're working on. Uh, finding something to be excited about will keep you going. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm sorry for <laughs> not having more. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's the answer. Not, not as unrelatable as you might think. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. We should talk about it so I, I can talk to my therapist about it. Okay. No, I think um, we're just about at time, yes. as, unless anyone has a burning question. Um, but I think we're good. So everyone give a round of applause for Diana. Thank you so much. Thank you.